Happy Tuesday, Locked On Cardinals fans. I am Lucas Smith, host of the show. It's NL Central Roundtable discussion today as I am joined by the hosts of the rest of the teams in the National League Central Division, Pirates, Cubs, Brewers, and Reds. It's a great discussion as we talk about who might win the division, who has the best prospects, who has the best trade ships. It's a great preseason discussion as opening day is just a few days away. It's going to be a good season, and it's going to be a good discussion on the roundtable today, so stay tuned for a good one on Locked on Cardinals. You are Locked on Cardinals, your daily St. Louis Cardinals podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. We have a special event for you today. All of us locked on in El Centro. Well, almost all. Dom wasn't able to be with us here today from Locked On Brewers. But Vinny's with us, as is Lucas from Locked On Cardinals, Andrew from Locked On Cubs, Ethan from Locked On Pirates. Oh, and yeah, my co-host, he's with me too, Steve. It's it's nice to have everybody on board. Sorry, Steve, didn't mean to just uh, single you out there. We are going to talk about... What is going to happen in this most interesting division? Last year, there were people that predicted the division winner to have an under 500 record. Well, and as Vinny will attest, that didn't happen. This year, it almost looks as if the exact same thing will happen as last year. looks like the Brewers are going to finish first. The Cardinals will finish second. I don't know. I think we all have feelings about this. But first off, uh, how do the Brewers lose this division? You know, I don't see any possibility for that happening, right? I mean, I think, I mean, Zips in Vegas and all that has them projected like 88 wins, 90 wins. I think that's totally wrong. I think 95 wins last year after Willie Adamas came on board, they were 30 games over 500. So they have the exact same roster pretty much. Um, and, and they actually even added a couple of pieces, that I think, upgrade their team. So 100 wins for me is not out of the realm of possibilities. I know some people might think I'm a little bit crazy, but there's a not only a division title in their future, but I think a World Series title is very, very possible for the Milwaukee Brewers. I think the Cardinals have a have a legitimate shot at that at that crown. I do. I, I you know I'm not trying to discredit the Brewers, like you said, they were a very good team last year. And throw in the fact that the additions they had, but I just think that this Cardinal offense, you know, maybe Albert Pujols doesn't make them a World Series contender, but I do think that it improves the offense just enough. I think you know for, for me that the weak point of the Brewers' point was was the offense. And yes, I think they got Hunter Renfro this offseason. That pitching staff is going to be really hard to beat, but I don't think it's going to be a 10, 12, 13 game advantage that the Brewers have over any teams. I think that the Cardinals are going to make it interesting on them as well as I think, you know, the Reds could be a thorn in people's sides, including the Brewers. But I do think that this is a two team race between the Brewers and the Cardinals. I think the interesting X factor is going to be Christian Yelich, right? Does he bounce back? And if he does, then what does that mean for everybody else? Because he was here. He was terrible, right? I mean, at times he looked at, at times he looked awful, right? He still got on base, which but we don't want him to get on base. We don't want him bunting like he did against the Reds uh, to score the winning run. Uh, that game when was that? Back in July or whatever it was. Yeah, we don't want him doing that. We want him hitting balls over the fence, and um, and I think it's just a matter of him snapping out of it mentally i think the swing is no different looks no different the bat speed still looks like it's there i think he's just kind of domed up a little bit at this point and it's just going to take him a little bit of time to kind of get through these struggles i'm sure there was a, a lot of pressure on him to perform up to that contract extension that he signed and so eventually he will snap out of it i mean you don't do what he did in 2018 in the second half and then all of 2019 you don't put those kinds of numbers up you don't show that kind of ability and then just all of a sudden lose it i think eventually he'll snap out of it and get back to some semblance of what that looked like so um yeah i mean they'll run away with everything if he does do that but you don't necessarily need them they were eighth in runs scored in the major leagues after again after willie adamas joined that club may 23rd is that big day so they were eighth in the league in runs scored. Everyone talks about how bad the offense was. I think the offense is actually pretty decent. They don't have too many holes in their lineup. So, um, yeah, I, I think if he bounces back, yeah, they'll run away with everything, in my opinion. 
So with the idea that it's a two horse race, I have a question because there was a team that was making a lot of noise this off season. How serious are the? I know it helps that they got a starting pitcher handed to them by a division rival, but uh, they also made some well, other good moves too. That uh, yeah, no, I know. Me and Steve have really belly ached about that quite a bit. But uh, how serious are the South Siders or the North Siders? Well, Jeff and Steve, I, as much as you've belly ached, I've I've uh, been joyous about it. I think I've talked about <laughs> Wade Miley in every episode since December first on Lockdown Cubs. Well, but unfortunately. Should. Yeah, it's, unfortunately, he's dealing with some inflammation in his elbow now, so he'll be on the shelf for a, for a little bit to start the season anyway. I mean, the Cubs, you know, Cubs brass wants us Cubs fans to think that they're serious. Uh, it seems that that's the case. Um, they've been busy as you know what this offseason. You guys know it. Uh, tons of veteran arms they've brought in. Obviously made a little bit of a splash with the Suzuki signing, which is very exciting here in Chicago. We'll see how his game translates to to the major leagues. Um, Stroman before the lockout. You know, I I don't know. Again, I, I don't think, and I've said this a bunch on Lockdown Cubs, I don't think the National League Central is this world beater division. So when you're when you're playing in a landscape that, you know, gives you a potential to to steal a few games here and there, you never know. You could surprise a few people if some things click, but I'm I'm with you guys. I mean, to say that the Brewers are not the favorite on paper would be a mistake. Uh, Vinny, I'm right there with you. I think the offense is better than people get, give it credit for in Milwaukee, but you know, a, a repeat of 95 wins is t- it's a tough ask and a lot of things have to go right and you have to stay healthy too. So it'll be, uh, you know, it's obviously it's a long season, but it, betting against the Brewers would, would probably not be the, the wisest thing in the world. Yeah, yeah I, I, Oh, go ahead, Jeff. No, no, no. Go, go, go ahead. Phil. I was just going to agree. I was going to agree with that. And and so here's the thing. I, I do get it. 95 wins is a big ask, right? And to repeat what they did last year. But here's the thing. <clears throat> and, and here's what I don't think the projections and all the analytics and the data that come up with these win totals figures in is that they win a ton of close games. Why? Right? Because... Their pitching staff doesn't give up runs. They got like three of them that are Cy Young Award winners, potentially, and they're not going to regress. Again, staying healthy, excellent point, of course, that goes without saying. But then they have the back end of the bullpen, Devin Williams and and Josh Hader. So they're going to win a ton of close games. They're not going to, you know, they're not going to be the Cardinals where they're going to score 15 runs, you know, four games in a row or, you know, score 60 runs in a series or something like that because of their bats and their power potential and stuff like that. They're not going to do that. And so I do think those projections kind of take that into account a little bit more than um, than just, you know, in, intuition, essentially. And kind of with the thought of this two-horse race, the only question I have for St. Louis is how many games in a row do the Cardinals have to win for Marmol to keep his job? Because obviously <laughs> last year they didn't win enough. Clearly not. There was just a really intriguing piece in the USA Today a couple of days ago, a little bit more details about the firing of Mike Schilt. And it, it's been a complex issue, and I, I don't think we've heard the last of it. I think there's still something that, that needs to be discussed. I don't know what it is, but there, from the moment that happened, it didn't feel right for, for Mike Schilt to be fired for a lot of different reasons. And we could do a whole 40-minute segment on that if you wanted to, so I won't bore anybody <laughs> with that. But I'm really excited about Ali Marmol, the new manager, I believe is going to be the youngest manager in baseball this season. And he, he's talked a lot about what I like about him is the lineup fluidity that he has talked about a lot. And, you know, not just sticking to one lineup for 162 games, he's going to mix, you know, mix and match. Albert's going to be the, the, the DH against left-handed pitching for just as an example. So I'm excited about Marmol and I just hope it doesn't take 17 wins to make the playoffs again, because it was fun while it lasted last year, but I'd like a little bit more security this year for the Cardinals to make the playoffs. You know, we always joke here in Chicago, guys, the Cardinals seem to find this player you've never heard of for the last 10 (laughs) years. He comes up and has seven home runs at Wrigley Field over a four-game series and then goes on to hit 35 and leave town just scratching your head thinking, where do they get these cats from and why can't we do it? Well, it, as Jeff loves, it's just the Cardinal way. And I had to get that in one time. It's just the Cardinal way. (sighs) (laughs) <laughs> and everybody shakes their heads. There's somebody that's shaking his head right now. He hasn't spoke yet, and I still want to know what on earth is going on. Um, why is O'Neill Cruz not in Pittsburgh, Ethan? No. It really is, at the end of the day. 
Yeah, sorry. I forgot that I was using these today and not my other thing. But yeah, at the end of the day, uh, everybody in baseball does it. And I don't think people realize that everybody in baseball does it. But, you know, Kevin Newman and Cole Tucker have had very strong springs. So I see no reason for him to be there right away. But at the end of the day, if O'Neill Cruz finishes top two in Rookie of the Year, like me and Lucas had a five-month resurgence last year about Dylan Carlson and Key Brian Hayes, I will rightfully say I lost that battle last year. But O'Neill Cruz right now on Bet Online is three to one odds to win Rookie of the Year. He wins that with the new CBA and the on-field player-based incentives. Things get very interesting in terms of the amount of money that he's going to make anyway. And I think the team with the just widest uh, range of outcomes at this point is the team that Steve and I talk about because Lord knows what on earth is going on down at 100 Pete Rose way. Uh, Steve, what are we thinking? <laughs> well, I think the description of the reds as a thorn in everybody's side is probably the most accurate description that you could put on this team. Including our own uh, sides. Right. Because it's, it's simply a matter of, we really just don't know what we're going to get. There are so many unanswered questions uh, gone are Nicholas Castellanos gone is Wade Miley gone is Eugenio Suarez gone is Jesse Winker gone is Sonny Gray. Lots of gone uh, coming in as a bunch of young guns that we aren't exactly sure how they are going to perform. Now, if they come in and perform great, this team could uh, sneak into that number two spot in the division uh, blowing straight past the Cardinal way or whatever the hell it is we're going to call it. <laughs> but it, the fact of the matter, is we don't know. Uh, we do know that the rotation is going to feature a bunch of great young arms. We're going to see Hunter Green. At some point this year, we're going to see Nick Lodolo. Uh, we're going to see Reaver San Martin to start the season. Somewhere along the way, we'll probably see Graham Ashcraft. Uh, the bullpen has some good arms out there, although it's not arms that uh, strikes fear in the opponent, but they're very good. Luis Sessa is very good. Art Warren is very good. Uh, there, Lucas Sims will come off the disabled list, and he will be very good out there. So there's good bullpen. There's good starting pitching. Uh, and then from the position players, that's probably where the most questions exist. Can Mike Moustakas play third base consistently throughout the year and still hit? Is there anybody that can step up and be a solid outfielder on this team? We just don't know. It's going to be a bunch of platoons tunes and a roll of the dice as to whether Nick Senzel can be healthy or not. And uh, again, it really comes down to do all those things go the Reds way. Great. We're talking about second place. Do they not go the Reds way? Well, we're battling Ethan out in Pittsburgh for the, the bottom end of the division. So um, of all of the teams in this division, the, the biggest question mark and uh, the most, uh, I don't know if fun positions to watch, but just a lot of youngsters that we can really see take strides this year uh, are in Cincinnati. So uh, win or lose, I'm really looking forward to, to this team getting onto the field just to see if this promise of the youth has been overblown or overhyped, or if these guys really are uh, going to be able to uh, live up to the ex expectations that have been placed on them so far. And that's kind of where I get my thinking as to how this division's going to play out. Because with the Reds, you have a lot of question marks, a lot of lightnings in a bottle type situations. With the Cubs, you have a little bit less, but kind of the same amount of lightnings in a bottles type situation. You need the world to flip on its you know axis for the Pirates to get up there on top. I'm sorry, Ethan. I mean, I think you know that, but that's kind of where we are. But then you look at the Cardinals, it's a lot less, a little bit more sure that they're going to be up there. And same with the Brewers. So when I look at that, I'm saying I still think the Brewers win this division. And I think it kind of stays boring and it goes Brewers one Cardinals two. Lucas, what are you thinking there? I, I definitely, you know, I've said a lot on this show and Andrew called it a mistake, but I do think the Cardinals are, could be considered a favorite in the division. I, I said, I've said that a lot. You know, I, I, you know, again, I could be biased covering this team day to day, but I really do like this pitching staff. It might not have the three so young candidates or the, the three all-star closers, sorry about the light there, um, that the Brewers have, but I think okay. one to five, it's, it's going to be solid in the rotation, and this bullpen has a chance to just be electric. They're, they're going to compete for division title. There's no question in my mind that they make a, make the playoff spot, especially with the, what is it, 21 playoff spots it seems like the league has now. <laughs> uh, but they'll make a division run. I, I think they're going to give the Brewers a run for their money um, at, at the top of the division. I think it's a really close race, one to two. And and we have to what you have to remember the Cardinals have been a thorn in the Brewers' side for the entirety of the time that they've been in the NL Central. So I mean, don't think for one minute that the entire city, all the fans, even the even the players probably, kind of know that. 
and understand and remember those days when Tony La Russa was messing with them and, and totally just beating them incessantly all the time. So, I mean, that's, that's a factor, right? I mean, it's a, it, there, there is something real and I, and I apologize for anyone who's going to get offended by this um, other than ETH or other than Lucas, that um, there is something to that, the, the Cardinals way thing, right? I, I mean, I scouted for a long, uh, for four years and I scouted the, the St. Louis, organization up and down there is something in the water down there in Jupiter there really really is okay so I watched Tommy Edmond develop from a skinny could barely throw the ball to first base could barely hit the ball out of the infield into a legitimate you know guy that took Colton Wong's position okay I mean so there's something to it there's going to be a guy again that we've never heard of this year come up and and start raking in the big leagues so um I, I totally get that, and the Brewers are definitely going to be kind of, in my opinion, looking in their rearview mirror that, to a close um, second place, mind you, second place <laughs> Cardinals team. Andrew, how are you feeling on the Cubs? Do you think they're going to sneak in there, or do you think it's going to be uh, the Brewers or the Cardinals? I, you know, I think I think you hit it on the head, Jeff. I think that uh, you know, there's they have less lightnings in the bottle to catch than maybe a couple other clubs in the division. Uh, they would need a lot to go right to have a successful year. I mean, depth is still an issue. They've kind of retooled the pen with a bunch of veteran arms, which, you know, you know, you never know what you're going to get there. I mean, let's be honest. Last year, this was a, you know, a team that was 10 games over 500 at one point in June. They had a top three bullpen in all of baseball up until July 1st. And then we, we kind of know how the narrative ended and it wasn't uh, to our liking here in Chicago, but it was something that had to be done. Um, you know, can you regain some of that form? I, I I don't know. I love how busy they've been because the biggest question mark here from all of us Cubs fans was how committed were they going to make it look like they were this offseason and putting a winning team back on the field. And it seems that they've sold us pretty darn well that, yeah, hey, we're, we're in this to to make a splash, maybe not this year, but at least position ourselves for 2023 and beyond. Um, the Brewers are tough, man. Vinny, I, I hate to say it, but I, I it's true. I mean, you're right on the money with everything you said. And I do think, and I've been preaching this a lot, um, I do think the Cubs could surprise a lot of people in a good way. But yes, to your point earlier, Jeff, they would have to have a lot of pieces click. A la the Giants last year, who kind of, you know, surpass their projections uh, early in the season or preseason by 25, some 26 wins um, with a lot of veteran guys that kind of flew under the radar. Is, is that something that's going to happen here in Chicago this year? I mean, that would be a slim chance, but I think they, <laughs> they tried to copy that mold. Um, and I like the approach. So they, they've, they've shown their willingness to, to spend some money and, and hopefully start to turn the corner again. With the man whose center fielder currently is Brian Reynolds, Ethan, how are you thinking? At at this point, I mean, with what the Brewers have, it's very hard to bet against Corbin Burns and Brandon Woodruff, as well as like Devin Williams and Josh Hader. And I mean, I kind of have to root for Milwaukee now because they have Andrew McCutcheon. <laughs> makes Vinny, it makes me want to throw up. I, I will be honest, it makes me want to throw up to have to say that. But also, I mean, again, there's just so many things that the Cardinals do well also that I just would not be shocked with either of those teams winning. Now, obviously, if my team wins, it'd be the greatest betting thing of all time if somebody bet on them to win the NL Central. But, I mean, honestly, any of these four teams, if they won and there was reasonability behind it, I probably wouldn't be that surprised. I'm just more or less here to cause chaos as the Pirates team, honestly. That's all we ever do. We're just here to cause chaos. But I would have to say the Brewers if I was a betting guy. I think if the Pirates won, you'd have to pinch yourself to wake up from a dream, and we would have to pinch ourselves to waking up from a nightmare if the Pirates end up on, <laughs> on top in the division. Yeah, but they'd still find a way to justify trading Brian Reynolds and not extending him yet. <laughs> probably so, Steve, probably so. Steve, what you thinking? You know, you look at this division, and I think it's pretty it's pretty easy to see bookends. You can see you can see the 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 top end of it, and and you see the Milwaukee Brewers, and you can see the bottom end of it, and and you see the Pittsburgh still hanging around down there, and then you've got these middle these middle three teams that honestly are why you play the games. Uh, will everything go the Cubs way? Will everything go the Reds way? Will the Cardinals be able to put it together over the course of an entire season and not in just, just in the last month? We don't know. 
Um, and I think that's what will make this season fun to watch. I think that each of these teams uh, has some some great situations playing out that are going to make them fun to watch, whether it's the youth movement in Cincinnati or in Pittsburgh, whether it's the, the pieces that are being brought into Chicago and just waiting to see exactly how they perform or are looking at the Cardinals to see if uh, they are able to gel and what is going to be this god awful yachty uh molina farewell tour that we're all going to have to endure it's going to be there's going to be storylines and uh, from the cincinnati aspect of it i think that uh, the reds are going to be that thorn i think some of these young guys are going to have their moments and at the end of it the the inexperience and the youth will be just enough to maybe keep them out of that uh that second spot in the division but but who knows we might get lucky we might capture that lightning but i do know one thing listening to everybody talk today hearing about these teams knowing what's in store for the national league central there's definitely going to be fun baseball to watch for 162 games steve to your point if i could jump in real quick you know it's the those middle three of the division cubs Reds, Cardinals, will will say uh, they fit that adage. Everyone wins sixty, everyone loses sixty. It's what you do with the other forty that makes or breaks your year, right? I mean, that is never more true than with those three in the middle. It's <laughs> a great point. Yeah, Ethan's like, well, sometimes you win sixty five. <laughs> <laughs> call it a day. Uh, <laughs> well, and if there's anything that we can also take away with this, is that crossovers between Reds and Cardinals are going to be a lot of fun this year. <laughs> you know what else is going to be a lot of fun? Our discussion coming up as to who won the offseason. I think it's probably between two teams. We're going to be talking the Cardinals Cubs rivalry in just a moment, and which farm system has got the team of its ownership. Uh, poised for future success that's coming up here after i tell you about athletic greens athletic greens is the way to get your health on track this season and every season because if you start your day with a scoop of athletic greens in a water bottle you are going to get over 75 nutrient rich stuff going on in that AG1 formula. You've got to check it out. It's got all kind of great probiotic stuff, and it's going to help you absorb the vitamins that you take in in your everyday diet. Check out Athletic Greens today at athleticgreens.com slash MLB network, and you will get an amazing offer, a free one-year supply of vitamin D3. Check it out today. That's Lock it's athleticgreens.com slash MLB network to get your health in check with the power of a G one. All right. Hey, that trick worked. Um, I'm going to move our conversation along because the off season that feels like it just ended about five minutes ago was quite interesting, not only because of the lockout, but because of the movement, especially in the middle of the division. And with all due respect to getting Hunter Renfro, the Brewers were already a pretty strong organization, but there were a couple of teams I felt that really duked it out. You had Steven Matz going to St. Louis, you had Marcus Stroman going to Chicago, and a bunch of other moves surrounding that. So my question to everybody, and first one to jump in wins, who won the offseason in the NL Central? Uh, it's easy for me to sit, or sit, sit here and say the Cardinals, but I'm honestly going to go with the Cubs. I think that they they answer a lot of questions with, with the pitching improvements that they made, even with Wade Miley being hurt at the moment, as Andrew mentioned. Uh, those I love Marcus Stroman. There was a time when Cardinal Twitter really wanted him to be a Cardinal, and he's not, and I think that he, he's going to thrive in Chicago. That Suzuki sh signing is kind of the splash that the Cardinals didn't make. You know, the, the, you could compare a lot of moves with both the Cardinals and Cubs made this offseason. And yes, the Albert move was a splash, but that's more of a, of a rhetoric splash. Yes, it made some baseball sense, but it was a lot more of the emotion side of it. The Suzuki one has a lot of upside on the field. So I think that while these moves might not make the Cubs a division favorite, without these moves, they're not even stiffing the postseason. And now I think that they're arguably one of the more improved teams in the, in the division. And listen, Jeff, first off, I'm not going to tolerate your disparaging of the fam signing in Cincinnati. I think that <laughs> it's it's a travesty that you left that off. But to just piggyback on what Lucas just said, yes, I think the Cubs are also the winner of the uh, the offseason role. Just when you talk about Stroman and Suzuki, that's enough right there compared to what everybody else brought in to really say that for this point in time on paper, what they did with free agent signings is is more impactful than what anybody else in the division did. Now, St. Louis did make the first move. What was that guy's name? 
Uh, that one was Drew Verhagen. I know. There it, it is. But, yeah. but Twitter, it almost broke Twitter by how monumental that move was. <laughs> yeah, I guess I'm a little biased, guys, but I, I think um, – I think the Cubs won the offseason, which means nothing, unfortunately. But if you're going to grade them out, I mean, it's well above average grade. Uh, but let's face it, they needed to do that. They needed to continue their their overhaul, um, you know, after trading the core away last year, to which, you know, the casual fan here in Chicago was still super PO'd about. But now we're starting to see the returns on on some of those guys that came back at the minor league level. And there's a lot of talent down there. And They've supplemented very nicely with some major league ready veteran talent. Like, like you said, Lucas, I mean, if you're, if you're with, you know, just a Stroman Suzuki alone, that's, that's a nice haul, but they've, they've done a really good job in the pen with, you know, Michael Gibbons and David Robertson and yada, yada, yada down the line. But um, let's face it, they had a lot more work to do than some other clubs did. So I'm glad that they, that they showed a, um, you know, the notion that that they recognize that right, or what, right away when Carter Hawkins was hired as general manager in October and, and got right to work. And I think, as crazy it is to say, they they probably would have been busier had there not been the lockout, which you could say for a lot of clubs, but they still found a way to squeeze in as much as they could in, in the time they were given. So we're we're excited here in Chicago. They 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 had a really they had a really good winner, all things considered. I would agree with that. I, I think the Cubs actually poised themselves to add pieces, depending on how they do to start off and kind of see where they're at in the first couple of months. Remember, 12 teams make the playoffs this year, too. So, um, you know, I think they are poised. I mean, I love Marcus Stroman. All have always loved him. He's a competitor. You know, you hear mixed on what he brings to the clubhouse, but um he is a competitor i love how he i mean though i love how he just goes about everything on the mound um so i think that is a huge addition to their starting rotation kyle Hendricks, i think you know he'll continue to just do what he does and and you know baffle some people and then um you know wade miley the wade miley injury is is concerning for that group though i think it's just kind of a wait and see just to you know, see where, where he's at and how he bounces back. And then, you know, if the Cubs are out of it again, you may see a, a, an additional, um, you know, a sell-off again. But they have poised themselves to go either way at this point, I think. Well, Kyle Hendricks could start. I mean, they didn't trade for uh, Chris Archer, so that's a good thing. <laughs> are we ever going to let that die? <laughs> I know how much you hate, how much people like to hate on that. Well, it was just like, um, what's his name? John Heyman, like, whenever he <laughs> signed the other day with Minnesota, John Heyman was like, yeah, uh, this is much better than what the Pirates did, trading him away for three top prospects. And I'm like, come on, dude, really? But also, like, to touch on it from, like, the outside perspective of a bunch of things, Milwaukee didn't get any worse. So is that also right. kind of winning the offseason in a way? Because you didn't exactly get worse. I wouldn't say the Cardinals, the Cubs, or the uh, or the Brewers got any worse. If anything, they all got better. Sometimes less is more. And you never know with the Reds, as you've already mentioned before. They kind of went younger. It, I mean, Joey Votto's still kicking it there, but you never know. Um, and that's where it's fun as a Pirates fan is because I just get to sit back and watch all this happen right now. And if I'm pleasantly surprised, I'm happy either way. So if from an outsider's perspective, Ethan, are you telling Reds fans to have faith? I mean, I sure would have faith considering we both have owners named Bob that suck <laughs> and we still root for these teams every day. Yeah, our, our well, and actually it wasn't Bob. It was his son, Phil, that came out and said and told Reds fans to have faith. And we're all having a lot of fun with that because, uh, well, the, the, the moves don't really lend you to want to have faith right now. Anyway, uh, speaking of having faith, there's faith in the future, and there's lots of future prospects that are very intriguing throughout this division, whether you're talking about the Cubs, the Pirates, or, you know, the Reds. We got a couple too. But when you look at the future for all of these clubs and you look at the farm system as a whole, I'm not saying about how the organizations run their farm systems or anything like that, because that in and of itself would take 40 minutes to try and figure out. But based on the talent that you see, whose farm system is poised for the most success. And I'm going to start you off because I think it's the pirates. I really do. As long as they don't mess it up. I think the pirates look like they're going to be pretty solid for the next couple of years. Oh, yeah, 100 percent. And I mean, you look at it and that's kind of what this entire team has been built off of at this point. You look at the Jacob Stallings trade to Miami, 
big reason for that, getting Zach Thompson and Kyle Nicholas back in, in that trade. And then you already look at the guys they have in-house. Henry Davis last year, Quinn Priester is regarded as one of the top pitchers in all of baseball in terms of prospects. You already mentioned O'Neill Cruz, the six seven aberration that is a human being. Uh, Nick Gonzalez is one of the best pure hitters from that 2020 draft class. I mean, Leover Piguero has looked good this spring. You're going to get a good taste of Diego Castillo and Bly Madris this year. Uh, Travis Swaggerty, I mean, I could do an entire podcast about our prospect system all the way through. It's just, I really hope that it does pan out because they're throwing all their cards at it. They're, they're, I mean, at the end of the day, the other four teams in this division, you guys have the talent centered around your team already. To say, yeah, the farm doesn't work out okay, like, we'll still be fine. For the Pirates, it's just keep Ryan Hayes and Brian Reynolds at the current moment. They have to hope everything else falls into place. I'm interested you to know, see Jeff, what, what the... Go ahead. I, I'm interested to see what, what the Cubs c- come up with their prospects in the next couple of years. I mean, you trade away uh, uh, Bryant, Rizzo, Baez, feel like I'm missing eight other players, but you trade away those kind of players in the hall they got... I thought it was a pretty respectable haul. So I'm going to take over Jeff's role for this one question, but I'm really intrigued to hear, Andrew, what you have to say about what the Cubs prospect. <laughs> I'm, I'm interested in seeing him coming out in the next couple of years. Yeah, it's a, it's a fair point, Lucas. I'm with you guys, Ethan, too. I mean, the P- Pittsburgh is – people – you know, I think the casual fan doesn't realize how stocked the Pirates are down on the farm, and, I mean, that's legit. Now, as bad as they are at the major league level, they're just as good down there, um, which, you know – Patience is a virtue, right? But yeah, people were PO'd here in Chicago last year when when that core went away, as if that there was still some hope that the window was open for another championship. And there was not. I mean, let's be honest, it was slammed shut. It was slammed shut a couple of years prior to that. I think a lot of people like uh like myself just didn't want, want to admit that. But um keep in mind. Lucas, that the, that haul that came back for the, that core started with the Darvish deal to the Padres the year before, the offseason before. I mean, they, yeah, they have um, they have stocked it up down there. I mean, Brennan Davis, obviously their top prospect is one of their own. But yeah, you talk about the names they got back, Pete Carl Armstrong and that Mets deal with uh, for Baez and Owen Casey, who was, I believe, part of that Darvish deal with the Padres back uh, to start it all out. I mean, this... It's exciting. So the fact that they retooled the major league level to at least some level of respectability this year, coupled that with with the system that they have down on the farm and the guys coming up, um, you know, maybe not quite as bright as as what Pirates fans are looking at in the next three, four, five years, but definitely, definitely a big glimmer down there. You're right on the money. You know, I look at the Pirates and, you know, it will be bad for the rest of us, but eventually they've got to win some games with some of this talent. I mean, for an organization that has been faithfully rebuilding since the turn of the century, you have to feel that eventually these prospects are going to hit it big and they will, and it's going to happen. And their farm system is very exciting. And you look around the rest of the division. I think each of the teams has um, some unique talented guys coming up. I I alluded to some of what Cincinnati has coming earlier when I was talking uh, just from a a starting pitching side, we're going to see Hunter green. We're going to see Nick Lodolo. We're going to see Graham Ashcraft. Uh, and there's many more um, young arms for the bullpen. Uh, Dowry Moretta being one of them that has arrived right now this year. Uh, and the position player side of things, there's there's a, a equally lengthy list of prospects that could be coming up. Uh, we could see Tyler Stevenson moving from behind the plate and over to first base whenever it is that the Joey Votto era ends. Uh, there's a young catcher at Dayton this year by the name of Nelson that could push to be a, a great major league catcher. We've got uh, rookie of the year, uh, Jonathan India, who's going to be around for a long time. And then we've got names like Ellie De La Cruz that could come up and play shortstop or third base. We've got Matt McClain that could come up and play on the infield or the outfield. We've got Reese Hines, who may have one of the best power swings in all of minor league baseball right now. So uh, there's there's, it's an exciting time with prospects in this division, I think. Uh, there's there's a lot to keep track of and a lot to look around and find, but um, there is definitely some fun talent to watch as you look uh, top to bottom in the National League Central. Yeah, I think that if they just continue to mess with uh, extra innings and, and what uh, that should look like, whenever the Reds and Pirates get together in a few years, they should just have O'Neill Cruz and Ellie De La Cruz do a dunk contest because Ellie De La Cruz is 6'5". So that would be kind of interesting. Um, but he's I not 6'7". What, seven. <laughs> yeah, no, <that's, laughs> you know, O'Neill Cruz would block him. I think that would happen. Anyway, let's talk about the best trade ship in. 
the National League Central, right after I tell you the best place to get your betting information. That's betonline.net. You're there, you, they are your number one source for all your sports info, scores, props, odds, and lines like never before. And right now, the favorite to win the National League Central is currently the Milwaukee Brewers. If you look at Bet Online, check out those lines today. You can also find some great stuff when you're talking about deals as we head into baseball season. And it's not just baseball season. There's still basketball. Of course, we're talking about NBA as we head into the playoff season. You've got NHL, boxing, UFC, and plus your favorite Vegas casino games, plus lots of great live betting options as well. That's betonline.net where the game starts. All right, as we head into the season, we're, of course, not even to opening day yet, and I'm already going to have us talking about the trade deadline. But, hey, it's never too early to talk trade deadline season because there's lots of great chips in this division. There's been lots of rumors swirling around about Wilson Contreras. Is he going to be a Cub? Is he not going to be a Cub? There's been rumors about anybody in a Reds uniform that makes over the minimum. And then, you know, you've got some other interesting prospects who might be moved for some help for the Cardinals and for the Brewers. And then who knows the pirates might just trade everybody or they might trade for a bunch of people who knows at this point, who's the number one trade chip in this division guys. Luis well, guys don't... Who? <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was hoping for. Actually. That, yeah, I love that. <laughs> Um, no, I, no, I go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to go ahead and say it outright because I had a podcast on this last week about the whole Brian Reynolds being traded to San Diego thing. If the Pirates have no like uh, intentions of re-signing him to an extension or whatever, just keeping him through, trade him now. Just, I mean, at this yeah. point, he has three years of team control. You're going to get three top 100 prospects at minimum for him probably and probably some MLB ready talent as well. It just really depends on if they want to do it or not, but they have to pick a side at this point. It's either you extend them or you trade them. And I don't want to see him traded. I love the guy, but if he is on the trade block, he is unquestionably the best trade chip in this division. In my opinion. The Reds are going to have a lot of pitch. Oh, sorry. No, Steve, go ahead. The Reds are going to have a lot of pitching uh, if we're talking about trading uh, towards the deadline. Uh, Luis Castillo has two years of team control remaining. He's a piece that they're going to want to move uh, if they cannot get an extension worked out. Tyler Malley is in the same situation. He's going to be our opening day starter. Uh, he also has two years remaining of team control. And if they can't get an extension in this new, uh, we're calling it the all offseason, uh, the implementation of the Tampa Bay model, if that's really what they're going to do in Cincinnati, then you absolutely have to trade those guys. Uh, some good arms out in the bullpen that uh, – as time is running out in Cincinnati that could bring a decent return at the all-star break in Luis Sessa in Art Warren in uh, guys like that. So uh, those are the big three. Then there's a lot of, uh, if those pieces fall into place, guys like Mike Moustakis, who, if he can show that he can still hit now, we've seen him play the field and, he, and with the universal DH that really helps him because uh, Jeff plays a better third base right now than Mike Moustakis does. So uh, if he can go out there and, and show that he can still be a major league hitter, he's also uh, on the final year of a deal that would make him appealing uh, as a trade chip as the deadline nears. Yeah, I, I, this this pains me to say because I've dedicated a lot of time, to, uh, uh, you know, on Lockdown Cubs to Wilson Contreras. But I do feel that uh, most teams out there like bullpen would say, yeah, we need to improve our, our our talent behind the plate. And it's, you know, hard to find a package like Wilson Contreras. And obviously, um, you know, he had some comments at the start of spring training that 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 chapped a lot of Cubs fans saddle regions and in, in saying that, you know, given where he's come from. And I totally understand that with the, the, the upbringing he had and coming here and working you his you know what off to become the player he has, that he would welcome the opportunity for free agency to an extent that it would be a dream come true. I mean, I, I know what he meant. It comes off. Doesn't sound the best, but I, I get what he was getting at. Um I don't think there's a team out there that that wouldn't want him if they need catching help. But to say that hurts because I've been I, I've been in the camp that one two with him and Jan Gomes Cubs catching tandem is as good as anybody in the National League, maybe even all of baseball. Um, but whether Wilson is here for all 162 this year remains to be seen. The problem with Wilson Contreras is you know the talent is there. I mean I don't think anyone's doubting the talent. He's I mean, he could play left field and, and produce, right? I mean, the guy is an athlete, 
and he can hit. My goodness. I think that the problem is that teams are probably going to be a little bit trepidatious about trading for him because he doesn't have a great track record of handling the staff real well. So that's, you know, first and foremost, I mean, you get, you get value out of your catcher. You get, you, you get, um, value that doesn't show up necessarily on the, uh, you know, in the analytics departments out of your catcher from being that guy that can, that can do, you know, put the right fingers down and really be that guy to have your staff rely on. And I'm just questioning whether or not Wilson Contreras is that guy. Um, so I, I, that's probably why he hasn't been traded already. Vinny, that's a wonderful point. I mean, really is. I, I'm in agreement with you on that. I uh, haven't seen uh, uh, most of the games he's played in his whole career here anyway. Um, and to be honest with you, one of the draws now, I suppose, that would maybe make that feeling subside to a potential trade suitor is you can keep him healthier by slotting him in at the designated hitter position. And like you said, outfield from time to time as well, uh, because he's had some lower you know, lower half nagging injuries with the hammies and fatigue and getting him out from behind the plate could could be more of an intriguing, um, you know, trade trade candidate for somebody, especially if he doesn't have to be behind the dish for 120, 130 games, you know. So, Vinny, when you're talking about the intangible ability to handle a pitching staff, you might call that the Yadier Molina effect. <laughs> Just to, you know, just as a name out there, if you want to put a name to it. I know Steve loves that based on his reaction there. <laughs> but I'll make Steve and Jeff happy because I'm going to go with the answer to the question being Luis Castillo. I think that he is definitely one of the better pitchers on the market right now, even health aside. But you mentioned the two years of team control. And at the deadline, what does every team want, no matter who you are? It's pitching. And Luis Castillo makes any starting rotation so much better than what it is before him. So I think Castillo is going to be the best best trade chip around in the, in the division. No disrespect to Contreras or Reynolds. Castillo, to me, is just some, is he is somebody that every team is going to want. Well, I'm going to just chime in real quick and say it's it's Brian Reynolds. It's it's I don't think it's close. I mean, it's three years of control. It's it's uh, basically Christian Yelich who can play center field. The Christian Yelich of 2019, right? I mean this this guy is an impact player. Um, on both sides of the baseball, I can't believe how how well he played center field when I watched him at Miller Park Am Fan Field. Wow, I haven't done that. Um, <laughs> but he, you know, just a just a just a cornerstone type of a guy, a franchise guy. It would take maybe more than three top one hundred prospects to to land him. Um, it's going to take three one hundred prospects that the whole front office for the team acquiring him be really believes in. In my opinion, is this is a guy that. Um, this is a guy that's going to impact your organization for a long time. Yeah, and to touch on that as well, I mean, there was rumors that he was going to head to Seattle, and the asking price was Julio Rodriguez. So that gives you the idea of like, what the asking price is. Now, a lot of Pirates fans have gotten upset because they're saying, oh, they're listening to trades, they're obviously going to trade him. To quote the great Jim Rutherford, the former GM of the Pittsburgh Penguins during our, play, our Stanley Cup playoff runs, you know how many conversations I've had about players? I couldn't tell you. Every single general manager in any sport talks about all of their players on the phone all the time to other GMs. That does not mean that they're trading them. You just want to get a gauge of where things are. And I think that when it comes to all of these trade chips, I will say this from a Reds fan's perspective, I trust all of your general managers a lot more than mine to get the most out of those trade chips. That's the one thing I'll say about Luis Castillo. But um, And it's nothing to do with Luis Castillo. It's everything to do with the front office here. Anyway, I think that's a great place to wrap it all up. This is going to be an amazing season. I'm glad that we all got to come together here before the season starts. We're going to have so many different crossovers as we go throughout the year to preview upcoming divisional series. Of course, you've got Pirates Cardinals to lead off the year. You've got Brewers Cubs. And the Reds just decided to go watch the ring ceremony down in Atlanta to <laughs> kick off this season. You're not going to want to miss it. Speaking to everybody uh, that is tuning in because you can – you can subscribe to Locked On Cardinals, Locked On Brewers, Locked On Cubs, Locked On Pirates, and Locked On Reds to follow along this entire season. The, Lock the NL Central is going to be absolutely phenomenal to watch, and I was glad I got to talk to you all to preview everything that's going to happen.